This is the Grow Your Clinic podcast from Clinic Mastery. We help progressive health professionals to lead inspired teams, transform client experiences, and build clinics for good. Now, it's time to grow your clinic. Welcome to the Grow Your Clinic podcast. My name is Ben Lynch. If you're a clinic owner and you're looking to expand to new sites and locations, or perhaps you're looking to create a leadership team that reduces a reliance on you and provides great talented team members a pathway to progress with you as you grow, then this episode is for you. I'm in conversation with Tony Beecroft, a colleague, a friend here at Clinic Mastery, a mentor to so many other clinics around the country as they grow, and also a clinic owner in his own right with a team of 20 team members at Melbourne Sports Physio that's in connection with the podiatry and medicine clinic as well, spanning multiple professions and expanding to multiple sites. Tony's known amongst the team here as a doer and he brings the energy and just gets things done. But we uncover what are some of the elements to him being able to create productivity and progress for himself and his team as they've grown. Let's pick up the conversation from a recent expansion that they've had to a new site and some of the logistics and key factors in making that transition successful. All right, let's pick up the conversation with Tony. So you've just launched your fourth location. I bet there's a bit of uh, brain damage that's been done over the last month or so. Yeah, we um, we jumped, well, we had four and it was going to be five um, once we opened the new one, but we, we closed a little, I'll call it a pop-up type clinic down uh, just that a month earlier than we were thinking about. Um, yeah. So we kind of had five for about a couple of hours and then it went back down to four. But it has been a, a bit of a wild month or so. Uh, we've had plenty of support and help, which has been great. But it's uh, it's been fun, but it's been chaotic. But now we're in that kind of breathe out, relax. Okay, let's, um, let's really change our focus now to the marketing side of things and making sure the team have got plenty of people to be treating and keeping them happy. So you've done it a couple of times now. I'm sure you've learned a few lessons along the way and probably even in this, in this iteration, learned some lessons. What have been some of the hardships or challenges in rolling out a new clinic that you've found have kind of been consistent time and time again, or the, or the big things you kind of need to care about and get right for those that are listening in and looking to expand? Well, it actually gets easier each time. Like you learn a lot. And in particular around the financing side of it and how leases actually work and what's a good thing or a bad thing to be including in a lease and what you should be looking out for. Initially, we had help by going back a number of years when we opened our, our biggest clinic. Uh, we got the lease negotiator involved to get some assistance on that front. And yes, it costs you a couple of thousand dollars, but my God, it could save you a hundred thousand dollars quite easily by not um, falling to some particular traps that pop up. And going through those discussions and, and having those discussions with the lease negotiator and future prospective landlords, you learn a lot about how it all works. So when the next lease comes through for your, your new premises you're looking at, you're, you're hot on the things that are, right, these are the things that actually are important and we need to get nailed down properly. And these little things don't really matter that much. And we can kind of, we can bend on that one, but this thing is locked in for us. Uh, even learning about how bank guarantees work from the first time many moons ago to now, it's quite easy. Um, you just know, Maybe it's not easy, but you just know what's coming. And there's no surprises or less surprises that pop up. So, And what are some of those big things on the lease negotiations that you've picked up from the negotiator themselves and through your experience that are, are key to pay attention to? Yeah. Uh, well, the numbers matter. Uh, yeah. And looking at how things extrapolate over 10, 15 years matter. So half a percent here or there can matter for, uh, is it if someone trying to, get you at say 3% um, increases or 4%. It may not look like a lot, um, but it will add up over time. Yes. Um, also 
I didn't know about a collar and cap where you can have at the end of your first term or second term, you know, five, six, seven, eight years down the track, the market review rate, you know, that could um, really jump up by 30% if you're unlucky or could go down by 30% if you're really lucky. <laughs> but putting, say, a 10% um, limit on that, saying, yes, we're going to have a market review, we're happy to do so, but can we cap this at 10% up and 10% down so no one, it's still a win-win situation to a degree, but no one's really getting really hard pressed or, or drilled into the ground, both from a, a landlord point of view or from a tenant point of view. So that was a, a good thing that popped up actually the second time when we um, changed locations. Didn't wasn't a conversation initially, but uh, different location that one popped up because different landlords have different ways of doing things. So yeah, that was from the lease negotiator. Um, and Otherwise, it's really thinking about the entire package because it might be simple. Say, oh, it's, let's say it's $100,000 rent. They're great. But if there's $50,000 of outgoings and insurances and elevator maintenance and aircon maintenance and things like that, it's not $100,000. It's $150,000. Like it's coming out of your pocket at $150,000. So just piling them together and not getting hoodwinked by what may seem like a cheap lease initially with there's some other hidden things that you may not be aware of. And have you used a lease negotiator in each one of your locations or you've learned through experience? No. Do yeah, this time around we didn't because uh, it was pretty straightforward. The landlord we've been dealing with seems like a legend, a uh, really good person to operate with. He, he had an outcome and we would work with him to get that outcome and it was win-win for both of us. So we didn't need to. We, we asked them initially, hey, would you like to get involved? He's like, you don't, you don't need me. This one's straight down the line, cut and dry. You know what you're dealing with here. There's no real surprises. Um, it's not worth the money for me to get involved here. Lads, you go and work your own uh, thing out with this. And there's just a couple little points to discuss and that's about it. So, And one of the biggest things in moving location that I've seen in the, in the community is, okay, we might get the lease, uh, we might get the fit out sorted then we've got to fill the books. Um, mm. We've got to actually see patients. We've got to be able to, provide value and generate value. Now it's context specific. You might just be moving down the road and most of your clients are following you and it's it's an easy transition, but maybe it's a totally new suburb, knowing mm. your existing brand or clinic and you're starting almost from scratch, probably the harder one. For your experience and for the advice you provide a lot of clinics, how do you encourage them to think about, say, the marketing side of things? Is that something you start super early? Is it something you wait till you launch? Like, talk us through filling the books for a new location. It's again easier with a new location when you've already got a couple of locations, even if you just have one, because you've already got a website. And we view the websites as extremely powerful tools. And if people aren't putting energy and effort and money, into their website to make it absolutely um, as polished as it can be, but also as, as ranking as well as it can be, then they're, they're going to struggle. Uh, but opening up a brand new clinic from going from zero to one, I think would be a bigger leap because you have to get the website humming and it can take months and months and months. Whereas if you're just adding another location to an already um, successful website, you've got some great traction behind you. So you're often racing. Saying that getting Google my business page up as soon as you've signed the lease, even prior, if you know this is going ahead, we're making this happen, I would get onto that. I feel like bowing down to the Google gods is super important and we have to do everything we possibly can to make sure that Google sees us as an authoritative um, website that's got good content, that's answering people's questions well um, and delivering value and the content is giving them what they actually want to find out the answer to, not just some fluff. So that can start whenever. That can start well and truly in advance. And really a blog on condition X can be suitable for 15 different suburbs if it has to be. You spoke there about investment in the website and maybe perhaps more broadly marketing. How mm. do you think about that? How do you allocate to marketing so that you attract more new clients in your clinic? We put a lot of money into uh, SEO. We pay a company to help us with that. Um, where we think we're okay at it. 
And I've gone through different phases over the last dozen odd years where I've swung from, oh, I can do this. It's not that hard. It's just putting up a few blogs uh, and cancelling our SEO contracts and then crawling back a year or two later saying, actually, guys, I reckon you probably are a bit better than me at doing this. And it's also, they are better at it. And I'm sure there's plenty of times I've been sharked by other companies early days. Uh, so finding one that you trust that actually gets results that you want is really important. Um, but also the time it takes to do the things that A, I know they do, and B, I don't know that they do. So there's some things out there, like they don't show their cards. They they do things that I don't know about. And um, I'm sure I probably could do it, but it's the time. Like, would I put all the energy and time into doing that rather, versus just paying someone who know or who I know I can trust that they um, they get it done. So uh, yeah, SEO is important. Having an editable website that we can do ourselves is important. So we do a lot. I personally do a lot on the website as far as updating this and changing this and putting a new blog up and doing these bits and pieces. And I could easily get someone else to do it, but I quite like it for some weird reason. And uh, I just know, probably the reason is I just know it is, if we get this absolutely right, it works and it's helped us get to where we are uh, over the last dozen or so years. Uh, I've also put money into Google ads. And again, same situation, I'd swung a lot between, oh, I can do this, it's not that hard, um, to someone else doing it better than me and in a more timely manner and in a more effective manner as in where you know, buying a click, a good click, cheaper than what I would do and we're getting more of them if I was doing it. So that's where um, the money uh, tends to go from our point of view. Globally, when you look at that, say in your PL, we often talk about different categories mm. of expenses and how much you might be targeting to allocate any given month, quarter, or year. Yep. How do you think about that specifically within the context of launching a new clinic where maybe there needs to be more of a spend up front? So, how do you think about using marketing budget when launching a new clinic? We look at it from a three month window. And say, all right, we just want this clinic working well within the first three months. And we want to be easily hitting break even by that point. And we're actually, it's week two and we're nearly there. So we're pretty happy about that. Yeah, so that's good. Uh, look, we're excluding the rent-free period, right? So, uh, But as far as covering what we need to cover with all the other expenses, obviously there's plenty of fit-out costs and these sorts of things. Um, we're getting close, but we're happily going hard and pushing to 5% on a P&L as far as a marketing spend. 5% for... of your total income is yeah. added to marketing. Yeah, yeah. And majority of that, so SEO budget doesn't change with the new clinic because they're doing the same thing. We say, hey, can you target your energies and focus towards this new location? Um, but we'll crank the Google ads uh, significantly, knowing that at the end of the three-month market, hopefully we get to week four or week six, and we can then dial it back down if things are going well. And if not, we're happy to spend it for the first three months, but we'll have a base level that once we cross that threshold, we're happy to be putting X amount of dollars per week or per month into Google ads, knowing that we're, we're happy to spend a bit extra at the start just to get things off and racing. And so you might go beyond that 5% in the first three months. Is that what yeah, you said? Yeah, I wouldn't go past 10, um, yeah. but uh, happy to push that hard at the start. And you might get lucky because I think that a fair bit of it is, is luck. We don't know. Um, we can look and we look at suburbs and say, all right, uh, this many people are searching for physio suburb term. Google Analytics is suggesting there's a thousand here in this suburb, but 800 here, but only 300 in that suburb. Um, is it the window of time you're looking at that that was uh, apparent? Is it over a whole year? So you might get lucky in that and hit the jackpot and just let it roll. You might think this is really good. This is working. We're actually, we're spending more than we're expecting, but it's returning more than we're expecting too. And what are your thoughts then on your team members creating networks, referral connections within the community, especially for a new site or location? Is that something that you expect of your team or have any beliefs or, or practices around the referral side of things sounds like there's a reasonable paid and digital play. Mm. What about networks in, in creating um, sort of referral pathways for new clinics? Yeah, that definitely falls into uh, the team element because especially when we're starting out, we're 
this clinic, we haven't relocated. We've come from a base of zero. So they've got time at the start and they're, they're pumped to do it because they don't need to talk to 55 different people. If they just have that half a dozen solid um, practitioners that are referring to them within their network, then they're there. It'll probably be 20 different conversations because there's plenty of knockbacks that come with it. But we, we already have a network out there that they also have uh, clinics and offices in similar areas that they can go and lean on. But it's not all on myself. I'm not treating at the moment. So I shouldn't be the person doing this, I don't think, because I'm not the one sustaining and continuing the conversation in the months and the years to come. So getting current team to go and do this um, and that, that they embrace it as far as, hey, I get to pick and choose the people that are going to send me my ideal clients. And often it's reciprocal. So if we've got some surgeons or doctors, we're sending ideal clients back to them. And sometimes it's not. Sometimes it might be the, the gym owner sending someone. It's, it's probably going to be more of a one-way street this way than it is the other. And that's okay. But we're helping, the gym owner knows we're helping them fix their uh, customers or clients and get them back to go and do more sessions with them. So um, having the team pick and choose what they want to do and really leans on their ideal uh, client avatar um, makes it a win-win for them to get out there and do it. And yeah, there's time at the start. The, the, hopefully not for too long, but in the <laughs> early days, there's some white space in the diary for sure. So identifying your ideal client and then identifying where they might be. So in other businesses or mm. other practices yep. and rather than doing a heap volume you're looking at going deep with just a few but maybe initially there's a few that you have to kind of screen through but mm. you're more of the approach that you know maybe have five to ten really good relationships and yep. continue to nurture them rather than try and have you know 500 exactly yeah because it just gets too hard to manage and you don't know and you're not going to manage them well like it's sometimes challenging enough to look after your five to ten uh, let alone try and manage 50 well. Yes. Yeah. And and you spoke there to sort of solving the problem or challenge for that referral partner. Mm. Is that kind of like a key part of your philosophy or approach to working with referrers? Because plenty of folks say, hey, I've done the referrer stuff. You know, we do coffee, we do lunch, and then this get crickets. You know, no clients are coming through the door. They're not being referred. So what have you found to be key elements in creating referral partnerships that generate new clients. We're actually having this discussion yesterday within the team. Um, first date with the uh, prospective uh, referrer, we try not to tell them much about us unless they ask. The first port of call is, hey, how are you going? Um, tell us about your dance academy. Tell us about your karate studio. What goes on here? Um, and just try and understand and get them talking about what they do. Um, people like to talk about themselves, I reckon, Ben. <laughs> people like to um, tell others what they're doing. They're, they're proud of it, which is great. Um, so letting them tell us what they do, what their challenges are, um, and then... Sometimes that's it. Conversation finishes. You're like, okay, they don't really care about us. They don't want to know about us. They didn't ask about us. That's okay. We've spent an hour chatting to them. We'll move on to the next person. But often they'll say, oh, so what do you guys do? And um, yeah, we do this and that and the other. So, oh, cool. That could tie in with uh, these people because we have these people that have this problem and uh, it's just not working. So oh, we could probably help you with that. Um, and off we go. That's how it seems to develop. But the first date or conversation is really just sussing out what they do, what their problems are, and just seeing if they're actually interested in us as well, because they may not care. Yes, that's a very good point. And yeah. you said you don't perhaps do this particular function as much at the moment because you're not going to be the one seeing the mm. referred patient mm. um, because you've made the transition to uh, from non from clinical to non-clinical, just being a business owner. Yep. Talk us through your yeah, talk us through your journey of going from clinician to full-time business owner. All right. It's winding back the clock a little bit. Um, so I was back on the tools 
uh, the last say four or five months when we uh, had a little pop-up clinic. Uh, but prior to that, I hadn't been treating um, apart from a few little sports gigs for, I'll say, two odd years. Um, but before that, I was a clinician for, you know, do the maths, <laughs> 16, 17 years, something like that. Uh, but I, I, uh, I cracked it one day. I was overwhelmed. Um, I, I was just burning the candle from all ends. And uh, I remember I was trying to do, I was basically consulting from eight till 6.30 with a half hour lunch break, which was really probably three minutes. Then doing all, going home, uh, then doing business clinic admin, whatever you'd like to call it, like the working on the business till say, you know, from 7.30 to 11 and then going to bed. Um, and it was just wearing thin. We had a new, our first baby at the time. And I came to the clinic one day and I sent, um, I was playing in clinic apps and I wasn't having my best day. And I sent a message to a couple of thousand people um, saying, hey, your appointment's been cancelled. Thanks for letting us know. Um, I was trying to start an automation. And I pressed send and then I just walked, I didn't realise, walked out went for a walk around the block and I came back in about probably only five minutes later and I'd been people at the desk is staring at me going, what have you done? Like, what, what have, I, what have I done? And Cause the phone was going ballistic. The emails were coming through, all the responses were coming through and I felt like a fool. And um, it was actually good cause we basically contacted all these people um, that hadn't had appointments for ages. And, and we ended up with, I think it was 43 or 47 new bookings from it saying, Hey, I don't have an appointment. I haven't been to see you guys for 12 odd months, but I'd actually like to make an appointment. Well, that's super. I should do this every week. Um, but yeah, that day I uh, I thought, no, something's got to give here. Um, and that's actually when I joined Clinic Mastery. I uh, got in touch with Jack and said, mate, I am uh, I just can't do it all here. I need some help. Uh, and then he got me on the, uh, on the path of, right, we, we need to... Um, focus the time and energy of your week. There's only so many hours you can do in a week um, without you know, losing family life, losing fun life, that sort of thing, and the social side of things. So um, it was really just a matter of then narrowing down. All right, we're going to pinch a day here. And this is no patients. We're putting other people in place to see the patients. And then I'm going to work it back from there. And then we just had a plan. Um, so good, it's working, great. Uh, revenues are stable let's cut another day down or two days down and put someone else in to help the patient flow and just a gradual whittle down over, I think it took me two odd years to get to that point. Um, I could have done it sooner. I think a lot of it was identity. Like I'm a physio. I want to keep being a physio. Um, and I still struggle with that a little bit. Um, so I haven't you know, thrown in my registration or anything like that. I still do a few little side uh, sports gigs, but over a few years to work out a, a I was struggling uh b this is what needs to happen to actually get the clinic where i want it to be and c have my um social life family life everything else still intact uh it did take a while to get there and it's still there's still plenty to do and ample to do but i feel like i have a lot more control over my week now which is good does that answer your question, Ben? It does. It's really right. insightful. <laughs> and everyone's journey is different. Uh, yeah. But it so often comes back to that point of, like you said, I'm ready to just throw the towel in. Some people it's, I want to sell the business. Or it's just yeah. a point where you're like, enough is enough. Mm -hmm. uh, I just cannot keep working at this sort of um, pace and volume and you know, sacrificing so many other things, you know, my own health, family, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And getting support uh, all those years ago obviously helps. What do you, now that you support other clinic owners, going mm. through the the transition from, you know, a major clinic load through to coming off the tools and supporting their team, what do you see clinic owners get wrong when they make the transition from clinician to business owner? Oh, good question. Uh, it varies between people, but... I feel like people that don't commit and they don't put a time 
in their diary, as in say, all right, in on the 12th of October, I'm going to drop my Friday afternoon from consulting and then take the next step and have good, that step one done. But then uh, 1st of January, my Friday morning's going and then have the next step. And then, okay, Easter comes around, Tuesday's gone and laying it out like that, but then committing to it. Or if there is a little hiccup, like if uh, someone resigns or moves on and the, the panic will be, oh, I've got to get back and do all this to get the revenue in. And they probably do, but knowing that, okay, that's allowed and that's okay, but that doesn't mean we fall back into how we were for the last 10 years when you've been battling with that or you wanted to change it. So yeah, committing, uh, not going all in there, I don't have to throw the tail in and drop 40 hours of consulting tomorrow, but having a, a plan and actually sticking to that plan and knowing that it's going to be a bit bumpy, it's going to be a bit wonky. There probably will be some little financial hiccups along the way, but in the end, it works out you kind of don't give yourself a choice you have to make it work out i was going to say um making that transition you just spoke to physio being so much part of your identity this is who i am i've studied for so long i've honed my craft done all mm. these years and then i'm making the transition to being a business owner how did you reconcile making that change from therapist to business owner well i kept it up my sleeve that I can still be a physio if I want to. And if I got the business to a point and the clinic was ticking along nicely, um, that if if I wanted to, I can go and work a day a week in the clinic. Or I could add a half a day here, half a day there. Um, but <laughs> clearly my identity can't be that strong because I haven't really felt that need. <laughs> uh, but having that in the back of my mind that I could do that and... I don't have to stop being a physio. This might just be a moment in time. It might be forever or it might be, I'm just going to do two or three years, four years, five years uh, without consulting and see where that gets the clinic and the team, see what the team can be doing in that regard. Still helping people. We're helping way more people now than when I was consulting. I could only help, you know, 50 odd people a week. Um, But now we're seeing hundreds come through uh, each week. So that changes the lens as well of how we're looking at things. And so today as a full-time business owner, mm. what does your role predominantly consist of? There's a few focuses or foci. Uh, main one being looking after the team is one, and that's got multiple elements. So I'll put recruitment under that umbrella. So we've got to make sure we've got good team members on the team because if we've got um, a bad egg, then that's not looking after the team that are currently there. So yeah, my role will be around recruitment. My role is around um, marketing and marketing fits under recruitment, sorry, it fits under team nurturing in my mind because if we don't have enough clients to be treating, then the team is probably not going to be as happy as they could be. And if we've got plenty of uh, patients and clients to be seen, the team's generally a bit more pumped and enthusiastic about um, going about their day. So yeah, recruitment, team nurturing by marketing, but also just team nurturing by checking in. So catch up with everyone every six weeks face-to-face. Um, and we just have a non-clinical discussion about how things are going, what's working well, uh, what should we keep the same? Is there anything we need to change to make their day better, easier, more productive? Uh, is there anything else they, they want to, is there anything else they want to get off their chest basically? So yeah, team nurturing, recruitment and marketing. Then there's all these other little spot fires and things that still pop up and that takes up a fair bit of time, things you didn't think of that just come up. I was like, oh, did not see that coming. But uh, so they're the main things. Then there's all those little side uh, call them projects as far as new ideas, new tech, new toys for the clinicians, uh, new clinic locations, and working uh, down those avenues that sometimes there's nothing to do on those fronts and sometimes there's a lot going on as well. How do you know what the right things are to do in your week? Sometimes I do and sometimes I don't. I waste a lot of time and that's okay. And maybe it's not wasted time, maybe it's time spent doing things and experimenting and tinkering um, and realize, oh, no, no, that's not going to work. Let's leave that alone. 
Um, so a portion of the week, which fluctuates from zero to you know 10 hours a week sometimes, um, goes towards that. But I have become a time blocker. I was really anti time blocking for the first few years of my um, business owner journey. And I don't really know why. I think it was more like, no, no, I'll just do whatever the heck I want, whenever I want. Um, but I was finding that I was missing things uh, or um, I work better under pressure than if I have heaps of time. Um, but I was finding that I didn't have to be under pressure all the time if I knew I could do these things um, consistently. So I'm quite boring now in my week. Like I'll have things lined up consistently repeating. So I'll have an hour on a Thursday to do blocks. And sometimes I take the full hour. Sometimes I'm up to date with everything. I don't need to do anything. Um, but I'll have these things lined up. Like look after the team here. They all our refer, uh, sorry, our um, our team nurturing sessions are built into the diary, my diary. So we know that these things just happen. We don't have to think every week, what are we doing? What are we doing? What are we doing? It's just the main things that need to be done are in there and they get done. And I tick them off and then I have extra time to go and tinker, work on the spot fires that pop up here and there um, and just play with other ideas that may take the clinic forward. We all need time for spot fires uh, mm. as business owners. You've spoken about team nurturing. I love that distinction of putting marketing underneath team nurturing. That, mm. That's a really neat um, framing. I haven't actually heard that before, but it makes so much sense. And as part of that, nurturing is about creating sort of progressional pathways for team members to retain great talent. You do all this work to recruit them. Um, you want to be able to retain them. You've obviously been able to do that really well to build the size of the team that you have today. What do you think are some of the key things that help you retain great team members? Oh, good question. Over time, I've worked out that I should stop guessing what helps them and what they want and worked out more asking them, hey, what's working? What's What do you like about being here? And then not changing that. The other month, I, um, I thought there was an issue around someone because we don't have set treatment rooms. We just kind of, hey, first in best dress type thing. Everyone changes it around. Um, and someone had a a more set room than other people. And I thought, no, we need to fix this. And I went and fixed it, but I didn't, I broke it. Um, I changed it, I created a bit of a roster for them. I said, what, what is this? No, I. some people were in the room saying, I don't like this room, the lighting annoys me or for whatever reason. Um, and I prefer the other room, like, it was fine. And I thought, all right, good, got that one wrong. And sorry guys, put my hand up, <laughs> made a mistake. I thought I was solving a problem, like no, nothing wrong there. And I told them that and they're like, yeah, you idiot, just leave it alone. I'm like, cool, we'll do. But over time, I've learned to stay away from things and try to only fix things when it's actually a problem rather than I'm thinking this could be a problem, let's go and act on it. So that's probably helped, but I've made plenty of mistakes to get to that point and I'm sure I still will. Um, uh, and giving people the time to tell me or someone else on the team when they're not happy about something. Uh, I think simple um, Google form focus sheet we do every six weeks. And I, I drill it into people like, hey, you haven't done the form yet. Can you just fill that one in? Like, we're, but we're standing here next to each other. You know, like still do it because it's great to have a nice little log to see what your happiness has been over the last, say, six odd weeks and how that trending has this, we're one of the questions, well, if I go through the forms, we ask, um, what's your health and fitness been like over the last month or so? Can't use seven. Uh, what's your satisfaction and happiness in the clinic been like as well? And I think that's one of my most important ones. And is that just a, a scale rating or they add some? Yeah, comments? no, that's a zero to 10. Uh, and then obviously we discuss it, you know, if it's sitting here and if it's a nine, like, great, but what can we do? to make that nine or 10. And I say, oh, you know what? I actually just had a bit of a few quieter patient weeks or whatever. It's nothing nothing we need to do. It's just I could you know, rebook that bit better, da, 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 da. Like, yeah, okay, cool. That's great. Um, we're all on the same page here. And obviously, if you're getting fives or something like that, something else is going on we need to discuss. Uh, and then there's a few other questions around what are they doing well? What could they have 
done a little bit better, um, who they want to thank, and then um, what are we doing well? What should we continue to do well? What should we start and what should we stop? Uh, and then the last one's here, uh, is there anything you want to get off your chest? Which is just a good way to open up conversations. Like, I'm not happy with this. I need to do that. I need to do this. Like, great. At least we know. I think checking in and giving people the time of day or a space to um, vent any frustrations, but also celebrate the wins too. Like, if they're doing a good job, it's a great chance to say, like, you know what? I've done seven of these meetings today and three people have mentioned your name in the, the uh, this is the person I'd like to thank for doing X, Y, Z. Well done. You're a legend. Keep it up. We're noticing it. You're, you're just on fire here. This is wonderful. Um, I want you to know that, that other people think that you're a champion and they see the things you're doing, whether they're saying it or not to you, this is what's happening. And we're often getting that for our admin team and for our practice manager um, and also just across the practitioner team as well. So I think that helps just to let people know that they're appreciated and what they're doing is good and other people like it. How do you get team members to give feedback and be part of solving problems and that it just doesn't always rely on you? Ah, yes. Well, something I'm still working on is not being that person to solve all the problems. It really is just flipping it back and uh, saying, all right, so-and-so suggested we need to do this. I'm like, great. How do you reckon we could do it? Um, what, what do you think we should do? Oh, I don't know. So, all right, why don't you spend the next week or two on that and then we'll um, and we'll, we'll catch up again at this time or I'll send you a message and um, you can fill me in. Um, so there's still times like, oh, no, I'll just do it. <laughs> yeah, quickly like that, that's an easy one. But if it's a bigger uh, project or we're implementing a new service or a new system, uh, I, I'm, uh, I'm getting better at flipping the conversation, like awesome idea. How would you like to implement that? Or what would you do to start this off? And then a little bit of a handball back to their side of the court. And when when they do give solutions, uh, I imagine sometimes they're very reasonable and feasible, other times maybe not so. Um, and in a similar way, when you're asking questions about what do they want as part of their role, as part of their career, I imagine if you haven't had this um, You've heard about clinic owners where a team member has maybe some unreasonable things that they want in their work or career moving forward. Yep. Maybe don't seem feasible or reasonable, commercial, sustainable mm. on the surface. How do you balance opening the conversation with practitioners about where do you want to go in your career and also then having some clarity about what the business needs and wants? It's a challenge. We we pull it back to well, our, our North Star is um, good people providing excellence in sports medicine. So if someone's idea or plan or concept doesn't really fit into that, it's a simple question like, does this align with where the clinic's going, what we want to achieve? And if it's a, no, not really, well, there we go. There's our answer. <laughs> pretty cut and dry, pretty simple. Um, if it's a dollars and cents conversation, I'll ask them and I'll help them pull it together. Like, well, how do we afford this? And how many people do we need to see? Is this realistic? Do you think we're going to see 100 people a week for this really niche condition when you've seen 10 this year? Like, no, not really. Okay. We just can't do that. Or keep finding a way to make that happen. Like maybe you have to build the marketing first, then we'll go and get the toys after and the tech after. Um, or you hit this point. So having a plan in place and say, hey, it's not a no. Sometimes it is. And it's okay to say no. We don't need to give, don't need to agree with everything. Um, we've had people wanting to put little, um, uh, like, I suppose, not side hustles, but outside of our sports niche, that there's other elements that like, this doesn't really line up here. There's other people out there that can provide that service locally better than us. Are we the right people to get it off the ground? Um, and does it, does it fit with our excellence in sports medicine? Not really. Well, that conversation is closed down too. And you call that your vision or your purpose? Yeah. Purpose. Purpose. Yeah. It's a really simple and significant filter to be able to run everything through. I really love how uh, pragmatic it is 
um, yeah. as your anchor point for all of your conversations. Plus the, rather than say no or say yes, or feel like, again, you have to solve something that on the surface is like, mm, I'm not sure how we do that. You're mm. kind of throwing it back and coaching them through, well, how would you see it working? And could we see a hundred clients in this, you know, random niche kind of thing that you've, yeah. you've picked? So yeah, I think that's really um, fantastic for those listening and watching in to lean more into the kind of coach mindset when you're having these conversations with team members rather than just always having to solve the problem, maybe in a more advisory mentoring sort of capacity. And I had one other thing, Ben, around, yeah. uh, mentioned about you know, how, uh, how do we help nurture the team? Um, as an idea borrowed from, uh, I think Shane Bennett mentioned that originally from Move Beyond around anonymous feedback. So every six months, anonymous two question um, Google form goes around to the team and it's, would you, it's a net promoter score. Would you recommend us to a friend or a colleague to work here? Um, zero to 10. And then after that, any comments you'd like to make, just simple open, open answers. And we've had some rippers. We don't know who you send them in, but we had some ripping feedback uh, on certain As in good, happen. good, good feedback. Both. Bad, bad, both. Yeah, yeah both, both. I'm like, do not ever change this. This is awesome. Um, keep doing this. And it was something simple along the lines of, I love it how your roster or the team's roster is lined up that we have a break at 10 o'clock, 12.30 and 4 o'clock. And everyone's doing that. I'm like, wow, I didn't realize that was so important. Like, it's so good to hang out with other people at the same time rather than being ships in the night. So like, cool, we're not touching that. That's great. Um, but we didn't know that. I didn't realize that was so important. Um, and then otherwise we've had some negative things that some were reasonable, some were unreasonable, um, and just we've seen it from different angles um, and we've worked those out. So we kind of, we'll then get these anonymous questions and say, hey, we don't know who put these in. We kind of have our ideas, uh, but uh, hey, if anyone would like to keep talking about X, Y, Z, please send us a message and we'll keep the conversation going because we really value your input and we want to make sure we get somewhere rather than just leave this as a ranting opportunity. Um, so we need some outcomes from this to see, A, what can we do? B, do you actually need to do anything? Uh, and C, are you okay with that? Um, and 90% of the time people have um, come forward and sometimes they've left it. Like, oh, we can't do anything else. We don't know what said it. So as as I've seen more clinics, I feel like they're always adding to their to-do list, you know, more ideas um, through conversations, books, podcasts like this, you know, there's no shortage of really cool uh, initiatives that you want to do. Um, but you can often be busy without being effective. And so feedback loops, I think mm. are just such an important thing to establish in your clinic, whether that's team members, clients, you've got dashboards or analytics, right? to be able to know, well, how well is that thing going before we make any iterations or changes? Um, maybe rather than just assuming uh, we know how effective, like you said, the breaks, uh, you didn't realize perhaps the significance that that had to a number of the team members. Yeah. So I love that sort of insight. And I certainly encourage a lot of clinic owners, rather than just keep adding to your to-do list things we want to change about the clinic, maybe do a bit of an audit, actually figure mm. out how things are going, analyze to the degree that you can, what's actually working and not working um, in various areas. So I really love that, that sort of uh, feedback loop that you've got. In terms of your own feedback, you obviously mentioned um, that sort of breaking point for you reaching out to Jack and, and getting some support. You've obviously hit some amazing goals, achieved some wonderful things and, and you're a hard worker, ambitious guy. Do you continue to get support and lean into peers, mentors around you? Why do you continue to do that given all the development you've done up until this point? So maybe you could talk to how do mentors help you today in your business journey? Yeah, great question. Accountability is a huge part to it. Feeling like you've got someone kind of just looking over your shoulder saying, all right, have you got that done? It just helps get it done. And it's purely psychological. It's in my mind, right? Um, 
But because you're you're one of the guys that like gets things done, so it's interesting to hear you say the accountability um, helps, and maybe that's the reason you're so you're so productive. Yeah, it's always that uh, you think, oh, gee, you've got a coaching session coming up. Have I done all these things I was supposed to be doing? And most of the time, I do. But uh, having that thought that someone's going to be uh, cracking the ruler over my knuckles if I don't <laughs> helps kick me along. Uh, but it's also other ideas. Like I only know what I know. And I, I generally think I'm one of the dumbest people in the room most of the time. So having other smarter people around me that have different ideas or even just a different way of looking at a situation, um, uh, I can sometimes get bogged down in a particular spreadsheet when someone says, why don't you just do that and that? I'm like, of course, that is so much more quicker, effective, simpler way to do it than having you know, 15 formulas all importing to each other. Um, so having just a different perspective of someone that's in a similar situation, but has also done similar things to me in the past and achieve what I want to achieve is helpful because otherwise it's just, just kind of like the Tony way, which is uh, good to a point. Um, but having just different sets of eyes and also people that don't have, how do I say it? Like sway or influence, um, particularly on our clinic, like an outsider's view is really, really good. So it's not all, they haven't been blinkered by our way of thinking that it's the Melbourne sports physio way. This is how we do it. It's someone else picking that apart saying, yeah, hey, that's good. But for this race, you might want to think of it from this angle. Uh, whereas you're winning this race, but this race needs to be uh, taken, or this path needs to be taken differently. So perspective and accountability, if we were to simplify and summarize, are the key elements. How, though, do you put a value on that? That How do you substantiate the investment of time, money, of course, but how do you know that that is truly valuable to you and your clinic? Uh, past experience, uh, the time saved, I can't put a number on it, but just knowing like, wow, I didn't even know that was a thing as have popped up multiple times and it would have taken me three to six months to work out how to present it or implement it with the team. And then another six months for the team to get on board. Whereas if we can a discover the, the thing and then b implement it within a month, because someone else has done it and they've been able to show you these, uh, these pitfalls ahead of time, the, the time saved alone is enough. Uh, and then you can look at it from a, from a PL point of view and say, hey, if we we did this and it's put another hundred thousand dollars on our revenue, well, the advice is paid for itself. Or if we stop doing that or refine this and it's um saved fifty thousand dollars of expenses for whatever we we're doing, um, or someone's just said, hey, your Google ads is not performing well, or you're paying this, but what are you actually getting for it? And you actually then go and look at it and think, well, no, that's not that's not worth it. That might have saved you forty thousand um, dollars for there. So there's elements and times that you can go. Wow, yeah, that's that's a clear eighty thousand dollar win. Um, that's why I'm getting this advice. But I reckon time is the most important one, and, and sharing resources amongst the community has been so helpful. That's really great insight. I think, as you alluded to, there's a number of different ways that you could uh, look at that return. Time, money are obvious ones. Mm -hmm. You know, stress, emotion, joy, yeah. happiness. Yeah. You know, if you audit, um, I guess as a reflection of time, your week and what you do, your role um, out of it. But I think that's really good because so often, um, I mean, people are at different stages of their journey. And uh, you've achieved a lot and I'm sure there's a lot to come. We'll speak to that in a moment. Um, but it's great. I, I agree. Uh, I love getting the mentorship and guidance, the advisory of people who are willing to call your bluff, call you out on stuff, yes. highlight or spotlight your blind spots, um, make you see things. Again, you might be learning the same thing. Just a different perspective totally changes your decision-making. And coming mm. back to that feedback loop, presumably – Pretty much everything we're doing in business is stemming down from decisions or even thinking, like you said, uh, about the time blocking, sometimes um, procrastinating, or that's actually creative in the sense that it's it's thinking time, it's wandering time. Yes. But really, it's like 
if we get better at thinking and having a model, like a mental model for making decisions, and we keep making better decisions over time, and those decisions lead to you know quality actions, then those actions lead to outcomes. We kind of have this kind of feedback loop and on balance, we make you know, net more positive decisions, net more positive um, actions. I think that's that kind of flywheel of making progress. Um, and there's an element of humility in, in all of that, I think, that is a willingness to be wrong, get the feedback and iterate fairly quickly uh, or mm -hmm. take action or, or course correct fairly quickly, which I find in a lot of health professionals because we're maybe taught Maybe it's our personality that we're attracted to the, you know, this this field. Maybe it's also then trained into us to kind of know the answer. You yeah. know, it's evidence based practice all the way through our units. Like you got to know the answer. You can't be like half good. Um, yeah. That's that's <laughs> not going to cut it. But no. in business, half good could be all right so long as you can quickly iterate and change. And that that's like almost a mindset and cadence, rhythm, belief. Um, paradigm that I think you get through experience. Hopefully you hear it enough from other people that you just embrace it and go, all right, I'm going to have to learn on the go here yeah. um, and have people that uh, can call me out and feedback loops that help me highlight where to get better. Yep. As we wrap, uh, those that know you and especially in turn, the CM team, um, you're one of the most positive, optimistic uh, team members. You get it done. Uh, you bring the energy what makes you optimistic about the future of allied healthcare and, and specifically as well in your clinic, as you look to the next three to five years, what are you excited about? What are you optimistic about? Personally, my team, there just seems to be some really good practitioners coming through of late. And I know they cop a bit on social media of the, the younger generation or I don't know what, what generation we're up to at the moment, uh, but I, I don't I don't buy into that. I, I think there's some extremely good practitioners out there that want to want to get better, want to help people, and want to help people get better as quickly as they possibly can. So I've just been really encouraged by um, the recent recruitment campaign we went on. I think we interviewed maybe I don't know thirty odd people, um, and we were spoiled for choice. Um, it was great. So yeah, the the people coming behind us um, and the people ahead of us as well, that's exciting that they just want to keep doing bigger, better, faster things uh, and keep progressing the profession is what excites me. And I think that is just befitting of your uh, mindset. It's so good. As you said, uh, they get a bad rap, but it's almost like those people keep attracting the 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 bad people. Or are they bad or are they just perceiving and projecting yeah. a lot of their own uh, biases and beliefs on this cohort? Yeah. Uh, I think it's there for the taking for those that um, show up with a uh, optimistic framework and also have some good systems in place. So uh, hit the nail on the head. I think uh, your approach and how, how you go about it, which is really refreshing, really energizing, really magnetizing for a lot of therapists, but also business owners to say, you know, there's a lot to take out of um, your story. Thank you for sharing so openly uh, with us here on the pod. Uh, for those that are listening in, most of you listen on Apple uh, podcasts. Could you take a moment just to give us a review it would be so awesome to hear how this pod specifically and other pods have helped you in your clinic journey and also helps us attract more great guests to the podcast when they see all the wonderful reviews of the community. All the show notes are at clinkmastery.com. Uh, you can head over there for all the previous episodes, all the guests that we've had and some free goodies. TB, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Ben. Oh, my uh, internet froze there. Thanks for having me, sure. It's been great. <laughs> Thanks so much for, for joining us. Thanks for tuning in to the Grow Your Clinic podcast. To find out more about past episodes or how we can help you, head to www.clinicmastery.com forward slash podcast. And please remember to rate and review us on your podcast player of choice. See you on the next episode.